Our next speaker is Peter Rosa, coming from El Colegio de la Frontera Sur in Chiapas and La Vía Campesina International. He's a former student of John's from the 80s, a colleague and friend, and he's going to talk to us about social movements, agroecology, and food sovereignty. or not. <laughs> I want to say right up front that I'm not going to answer the most pressing question that's in this room right now, which is how to connect to the internet here, because I haven't figured it out either. <laughs> and I also decided not to go with my original title, because I was thinking about what, what, in what ways has John uh, most, most lastingly contributed to the work that I do today, which is trying to balance on the one hand being an academic in Ecosur, and on the other hand being a full-time member of the technical support staff team of La Via Campesina. La Via Campesina being arguably the world's largest social movement. It's an alliance of peasant farmers, family farmers, indigenous people, farm workers, landless people, rural women, rural youth in 80 countries in the world. Speaks for somewhere around 200, 200 million peasant and other kinds of rural families around the world. And as a militant in that movement, but also as an academic, I've been involved in research for social movements, research with social movements, and research by social movements, accompanying the collective reading and transformation of reality. What do I mean by social movements? They're collective political actors. They're not political parties. They're not NGOs, and there's a lot of confusion in the US between what's a social movement, which is much more grassroots, and what's an NGO, which is five or six people with professional degrees and grants. Uh, <laughs> and so here's some examples of, of social movements, La Via Campesina being the one I work directly for, but members of Via Campesina include the MST of Brazil, the Assembly of the Poor in Thailand, not members of Via Campesina, but also rural social movements, is the National Indigenous Congress of Mexico, the Zapatistas, etc. And today, the tendency is that social movements increasingly control territories and build at least relative autonomies on those territories. Now, how in this work have I benefited from the wisdom of Chairman John? And I think the single most important piece of advice that he gave me, or gave us, and that he gave us not once, not twice, but many, 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 many times, was that the most important thing in your research is what is the question you're seeking to answer and where your questions come from, come from the people that you hang out with, the people you're with on a day-to-day -day basis, the people you drink beer, or if you can't drink beer, other things with. And I think that that's the, the, the most essential thing if we want to do socially re relevant research that has the actual capacity to transform reality is that we have to do it as several speakers have said before, together and, and if possible within the movements who have the correlation of forces, the mobilizing capacity to actually make change. Because change doesn't come from scientific papers several people have mentioned already. It often comes from the number of people that you can put in the street. So I think this is, for me has been the most important thing that I learned from John. And, uh, and uh, the kind of questions that you ask are very different. I remember John used to tell us that if you are a tomato agronomist and you hang out with agribusiness in the Midwest, you're going to focus your research on answering their question, which is how do we do, do away with farm workers and bust unions? Therefore, you're most likely to work on mechanical harvesters. If you hang out with farm workers, you're most likely to, to, to ask how can we do away with the short-handled hoe and have a more healthy and comfortable way to do farm work without farm workers losing their jobs. So the very questions that you start with that come from that relationship that you have with people. So when I work with rural social movements, the kind of questions that I find challenging my research or, or questions that need research to answer them would be things like what pedagogical methods work best when we want to use agroecological training to forge a historical political subject out of the peasantry. Via Campesina is focusing on agroecology as a major strategy, but not agroecology practiced by one family on one farm, but agroecology as mass collective action in resistance to agribusiness and trying to transform rural territories from agribusiness territories into family farming and peasant territories. How can we best use dialogo de saberes, or dialogue amongst different knowledges, to turn food sovereignty 
into an effective ba banner of joint struggle based on cross-sector and cross-class alliances? How can we use it to have consumers and the, and the urban poor fighting together with peasants and family farmers, for example? How does the, this, this question came from two weeks ago. We had the global conference on agrarian reform of Via Campesina, which was in Marabá, Brazil. And the main question that came out of that conference was, how does the recent rise of financial capital and the nature of the alliances that is built with extractive industry capital, the state and the mass media change the nature of the struggle for land and the defense of territory? And how should agrarian movements like Via Campesina or the MST in Brazil change their tactics or our tactics and discourse in order to respond to the rise of that new alliance of financial capital? That is a specific question now thrown from Via Campesina into a space where I'm a researcher, which is the Land Research Action Network, which is an ally of Via Campesina on research issues. Another key wisdom from, cha from Chairman John is that we are not Marx ecologists. Now, what he meant by that, he used to say a Marx ecologist is like an armchair quarterback. It's somebody who sits at home and uses Marxist academic tools to analyze reality but does nothing to change it. Whereas a Marxist, according to Chairman John, was somebody who was out, actually out there on the barricades with, with working class people in their struggle against the state and against transnational corporations, leading me to get, for example, clubbed by the Brazilian police in a, in a Via Campesina march in Brazil, or to get tear gassed and have my arm broken in a march in Quito and Ecuador. And it, it, it reminds me of that documentary, The War at Home, about the anti-war movement in Madison, Wisconsin, when the guy says, the guy who eventually bombed the Army math building says, in that moment between when the club hit my head and my head hit the pavement, I had been radicalized. <laughs> it, ha it has a strong effect on the questions you ask in your research and how you respond to them. Some assertions from a lifetime working with social movements. Rural social movements are an increasingly important space for the collective production of new knowledge and for new theory. I would say in, in terms of political theory, in terms of a lot of rural issues, all of the new thinking, almost all of the new thinking is coming from social movements like the MST and like the Zapatistas, rather than the academy. The dialogue amongst knowledges, Dialogo de Saberes, is part of that, and part of it is the incredible emphasis and investment by social movements nowadays in political training schools and political processes, including producing our own organic leadership, organic intellectuals, uh, through, in the case of Via Campesina, many peasant training schools, many of which now are at the university or even postgraduate level. This was our first peasant and indigenous peoples university in Venezuela, created by Via Campesina under an agreement with Hugo Chavez. And this was our first graduating class with a slogan that they chose, which is Estudio, Lucha y Organización con la Agroecología en la Revolución. They were uh, engineers in agroecology, 50% technical training in agroecology, and 50% training in political theory and political organizing. All research, every researcher has ideological baggage, is situated, is positioned, is located in, in relations of power. There's no such thing as neutral, as several people have said. What varies is only the degree to which this is made explicit and how aware each researcher is or is not of their own position. And it's very important when we work with social movements that we be aware of our positioning, that we be transparent. Key issues in, in doing research with social movements. Access. Most people couldn't, can't get access to, do, to, to social movements, allowing them in to do research with them. Most social movements distrust researchers, NGOs, political parties. It's not easy to be granted access, and it's easy for access to be cut off. The key factor is building trust and maintaining trust. There are all kinds of problems that have to do with the differences in class, origin, race, gender, vested interests, like the need to get academic points, that are differences between researchers and the social movements that they work with. Uh, researchers tend to be raised in the culture of individualism, social movements in the culture of collectivity, issues of money. Social movements have many bad previous experiences around the appropriation of knowledge, around betrayals, around washing their dirty laundry in public without their permission. And amongst uh, researchers and intellectuals in general, having a lot of confusion over when criticism and how criticism can be constructive versus destructive. Activist research with social movements 
The social conditions of the research are important. You have to find a way to participate in it in order to deserve the access that you're given to us. Um, some people have said that in the best case, research with social movements is the collective construction of knowledge, collectively by both researchers and movement activists. However, all too often, differences arise about which knowledge to produce, how to produce it, what to do with it, and who owns it. And the researcher has to be continually aware of the conditions under which trust has been granted and can be taken away. And in practical terms, if you want to be able to work with social movements, you can't just do what you want to do with them. You have to put yourself at the service of the movement. If that means making photocopies, if that means painting banners for a march, I see Cruz knows what I'm talking about. Uh, whatever it is, you have to be always available to the best of your ability to do whatever has to be done. And in exchange, maybe at some point, you get to do a little bit of research with the movement. There are a lot of attitudes that are necessary. You've got to agree with the movement. You have to believe that all kinds, of knowledge are, uh, all kinds of knowledge are valid. You have to practice horizontal relations. You have to avoid being the protagonist in the political process. Uh, you have to understand and accept what the movement wants and therefore be very flexible. You have to be humble, patient, honest, transparent, committed. I don't know how to say entrega in English, but you have to have it. <laughs> <laughs> or demonstrate it. You, you have to follow, live up to your commitments to the movement. Once again, the, the, the issue around criticism, as was brought up by Catherine Yee in the, in the Nicaragua presentation, don't do everything yourself. Don't make decisions alone. Always think about the power relations. Don't take sides in the internal conflicts. Many times researchers wittingly or unwittingly contribute to the splitting and fragmenting of movements. Be careful with resources. Don't make them dependent on you. One example, and then I'll close, is a wonderful experience I had in what Latin Americans call co-labor research, meaning research together with the social movement, which was, which was to, dom to document for the purpose of teaching and sharing in a farmer-to-farmer -farmer way the success in Cuba of the, of the farmer-to-farmer agroecology process. Via Campesina wanted to do it in order to have a book to be used in the more than 70 peasant training schools in agroecology that Via Campesina has in, all, in four continents now. But it was also possible to produce an academic paper in the Journal of Peasant Studies. I just mentioned that since a lot of us do also have to worry about academic points. And so uh, it can be incredibly rewarding and it can produce knowledge that is very useful to peasant organizations in other countries and very useful to academics trying to understand how agroecology works. With Helga and Bruce and other people in Ecosur, we have an academic group trying to understand how the scaling up and massification of agroecology works. And this kind of work with social movements is critical to developing a theory of scaling up agroecology. Just I'll show some scenes from the way we did the process, which was to have participatory workshops and farmer co-ops at all the length and breadth of Cuba and essentially induce using popular education methodology uh, peasant men and women to write their own, to, to reconstruct collectively their own history. And then our role was to be scribes, write that down, systematize it, and then give it back to the movement as a feedback to it. These are agroecological farms and families all over Cuba that we interacted with over the process, over, the, over about a year in order to come up with this collective production. Uh, here's an example of how, of how people in the workshops came up with the typical division of labor between different members of a family in an ecological farm, for example, on a typical average basis. Uh, pet, this is an example of one of the many, many peasant training schools in Via Campesina. This is a NAP in Cuba. It does both political training of cadre for peasant movements around the world, and it serves as an agroecology training center where farmers teach farmers or peasants teach peasants, including we've had pe exchanges with peasants from Africa, Asia, and the Cuban movement and all over Latin America. The kind of exchanges that we have all the time in Via Campesina, the slogan of Via Campesina, and now we're going to close with the help of Teresa with a short video. People talk about how do we translate uh, this kind of knowledge into ways that are, um, uh, that are useful for popular education and for people who are not academics. And I'm going to oh, stop that for one second.
So what this is, uh, I apologize to people who don't speak Spanish, but I think most people here do speak Spanish, and it's basically agroecology principles and theory in musical form as put together by the comrades in Cuba. And now I'll start this. I'm starting to make it the You can stand up. Dance and play. <laughs> So uh, many thanks to Chairman John for all of his wisdom and, uh, and really I have to say that has sustained me for all of these years. So thank you, John.